sorry. Oh, we're live. I'm sorry. Hi. Good morning, Harvest. It's like Pam's the director. She's like, get up there now. Go. All right. <laughs> sorry. Welcome to Harvest. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you all had a great uh, Thanksgiving and a little break that we had. Um, we are truly blessed as our Lord continues to send us opportunities to gather together in fellowship and ministry. If you're visiting us for the first time, please fill out the visitor card in the welcome folder, or there is a connection card found at our website. Uh, we would love the chance to get to know you and to minister to you in a more personal way. So this week, there are no meetings on Tuesday. Too bad it's not marriage refill week. What are you saying? I did his honeydew list. We're not going there. Um, Thursday is Word of Life, and uh, we have an adult teaching at 7. Uh, Friday, we have 10, Target 1010 at 7. And then Saturday, don't forget, it's men's breakfast. Hmm. Somebody tends to forget. <laughs> A little. Sunday morning, uh, please join us for our prayer circle meeting at 930. That is very powerful if you haven't been a part of that before. Um, we have communion service at 1030 and then a potluck to follow afterwards. So today's verse is Colossians 4.2. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Amen to that. And please silence your cell phones. Is it my turn? You may have a turn. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting used to this, Pastor. This is awesome. Anyways, okay, the important announcements. So important that they have their own page. So uh, let's go Should through I that, that real so you quick. Can have a um, yeah, <laughs> well, I got to read the first one first. So uh, the, the uh, Niantic Light Parade is December 11th this year. I'm excited. I'm uh, starting to get everything all situated. Um, if you would like to help with the float this year, um, please come see me. Uh, I think we're going to do Friday night. We're planning on putting everything together. It's uh, a nice, wonderful time to um, celebrate and, uh, you know, bless over the, uh, pray over the float and all that other fun stuff. But anyways, uh, we still need candy canes. We need a lot of candy canes. There's a lot of kids that love candy canes, and we just need candy canes. We need candy canes. Okay. If you need child care for Target, please make sure to sign up. Um, if you are out shopping, and um, please consider picking up some paper towels, uh, toilet tissue, and Kleenex for church. Um, there is a limit at some stores, so making it difficult for those who shop for the church to buy enough to cover our usage. So just grab one or two or whatever you're limited to and just kind of help out. Um, it's that time to get our church building ready for Christmas today. Mm -hmm. Pam needs uh, some help, so don't everyone. run <laughs> off. You guys, the doors are going to be locked. You're going to be stuck in here so that, you know, she doesn't get, st oh, she didn't say that. I'm just forcing it. But she does need some men to help out grabbing some heavy stuff. Uh, I'll help you out. I need a few things too, so. Um, they'll be perfect. We can help each other out, and, you know, pastor will be great. Sorry. I don't know why I'm so hyper today. But anyways, uh, uh, just a reminder that the Christmas praise party is December 19th from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, we will begin to fellowship slash social and then have a hour of praise and worship for details. Contact Cecilia or Heather. And today's quote, I would, I would maintain that thanks are the highest from form of thought and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. George Bergen was a Navy man who worked for my mother and daddy. My sister Gigi would remember him, but he mowed the grass, he kept up the yard, and um, when it snowed, he would be at two o'clock in the morning, he'd be plowing the driveway so mother wouldn't get snowed in. He did lots of things for mother, but one of the things he did on the side, he was a deputy sheriff in Buncombe County right here. And so every year he had to requalify to be a deputy sheriff. The year that he requalified, one of the things you had to do, and I can't remember exactly how many 
shots he had to fire and how many seconds, but it was like three shots within 10 seconds. And he had to shoot that fast and he had to be so accurate that he would hit the bullseye every time. So this particular year, he went to requalify for his deputy's license or his deputy's badge and he came back and he told my mother about it. And he said, Ms. Graham, he said, I went and he said, I was there and I had to go to the firing range and shoot the pistol and aim at the target. But he said, I just gotten new bifocals. And he said, I, I wasn't used to the way you look through them. And he said, I began to get nervous and I was uptight and I began to sweat and my bifocals steamed up and then they slid down my nose. And he said, I just closed my eyes. And he said, I pulled the trigger three times. And then when I opened my eyes, they went and checked the target and it hit the bullseye every time. And mother said, George, how in the world did you do that? And he said, well, Ms. Graham, he said, when I lost sight of the target, I just remembered my position. And today, with all the craziness going on, Amen. the fog, the darkness that's coming on our land, the confusion, the fear, and your glasses fog up, <laughs> remember your position. You're a child of the king. Jesus is seated on the throne. Good morning, Harvest. What a good word, huh? You remember that uh, when things start to get even foggier uh, in your life, and sometimes it seems like you don't know where you're going. You're heading in the right direction, even if you can't see in front of you, uh, keep walking in the direction of Jesus. I'm reminded of 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, mm. but of love, power, and of a sound mm -hmm. mind. We have to keep that in mind That's when right. all the news stories mm. keep coming up, mm -hmm. all the fear, all the stuff we were talking this morning in our uh, prayer circle. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between having a felt, healthy respect and taking care of ourselves and a spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. And you know when you've crossed over into that, that's not of the Lord. Mm -hmm. We're to walk in freedom and power. <clears throat> so God's going to take care of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. God's uh, actually just reminding us who we are. Um, a lot of times uh, we are so busy and we're rubbing shoulders with so many people who don't walk with Jesus and know Jesus, we actually start to become like them. And we follow them or we uh, uh, make deeper connections with them than God would want us to. Not that we're better than they are, but we begin to lose sight of Jesus. And what you're finding is the world is saying basically in their fear, uh, it's one thing to be very careful and you need to be, uh, but in their fear, uh, they're saying, we don't know Jesus, we don't hold on to Jesus, uh, and we're afraid. And doggy dog, we're going to take care of ourselves. And so you need to keep your eyes on Christ and remember who you are, no matter how foggy it gets, no matter how much the ground shakes, no, no matter how many financial things take place, or COVIDs with their different names and the alphabet, uh, uh, you just hold on to Christ. Just a couple of things. I, I don't see any young ones right now, but if we have any people come in with young ones, we are going to need some help in the nursery yeah. today. Um, also, we have probably half our church out not yes. feeling well today or else gone on vacation. So hello to everybody who's watching yes. us from home. Um, don't forget, you can still give your tithes and offerings online or mail them in here. Mm -hmm. The work of God's work continues to go on. Um, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. That's all I've got. Now, I may not, uh, not living in fear or anything like that, but I may not give some of you hugs or be hugging everybody. I'm actually having an operation uh, this week on Thursday. It's actually, um, uh, it's, I'm going to have Botox, I'm going to have a nose job, and then a uh, facelift. So my eyes may be pulled back a little bit. I'm just joking, you guys. Let's stand and pray. God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Father, we thank you for uh, this time of year. We thank you, God, that you have given us so much, and yet we have been thankful for so little. We have expected so much from you, and more than we could ever uh, imagine, you have poured it out on us. Lord, uh, keep us from emptiness. Keep us from uh, uh, unthankfulness. Keep us, Father, from looking at things instead of looking into your face. We ask God that even this morning that you would separate us from the things that have attached themselves to us, 
Those things are not of you. We just renounce in the name of Jesus. Most importantly, a sinful attitude, an attitude of selfishness and self-centeredness. Lord, we ask that you would come and have mercy on us. And Father, we come into your presence broken, knowing that we are nothing and you are everything. We ask that you'd rearrange all of our thoughts and our affections in your direction. We ask that your, anointed, your anointing, the Holy Spirit, would rest on the praise team and on me, and that these words that come out would bring glory to you. Father, I pray for churches around the country and around the world, and I'm asking, Father, that you'd raise up leaders to preach and teach and to worship, worship leaders as well, and Father, that this nation would turn back to you. I pray people would get tired of uh, um, being afraid and running away and they'd run towards you Lord especially me keep me running towards you break me when I resist break me when I am unbroken and when I look for other things other than you Holy Spirit please come and give us that drink that of the father that we need help us to worship this morning in Jesus name I pray amen let's give the Lord a hand love the line in this uh, next this song that we're going to sing. It says, we are your church and we are the hope on earth. We have to remember that with all the craziness going on. Jesus is the hope and through that, through the church, is how he's going to express himself. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us we pray, unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We Yeah. 
you, Jesus.
It's so quiet in here with half the people. <laughs> it's kind of nice. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, your grace is enough, Lord.
died for you to dwell. Here, oh Lord, have I prepared a resting place. Here, oh Lord, I wait for you alone. Here, oh Lord, I wait for you.
from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of man no scheme of man can ever blot me from his hand till he returns or calls me We always look for the presence of God, and it's always exciting when we see God moving. And Thomas has just a short little story he wants to share. I want you to come, Thomas, and share that for a minute. And then Sarah Klein's going to bless the offering. Just tell them what you saw. Now I'm not so hyper. <laughs> Great, great on the spot. Well, um, so it's kind of, so sorry. So last night uh, it was kind of crazy for us and our family. We had some friends over and, uh, you know, kids are playing video games and um, the night's ending and me and Michelle are going to sleep and kids are going to sleep and Josh comes in and he goes, you know he's having trouble going to going to sleep and um you know we kind of ask him why and he goes well one of the video games is kind of just going through his mind and he just can't sleep so uh we're like okay we had a a quick second just to talk to him a little bit about what he saw and you know decided that we would pray for him he came in and we wanted you know he wanted prayer so he kind of just in an awkward position just laid you know right on top of me and just bowed his head and we just uh just prayed for a couple of minutes and uh the amazing part was the peace that christ gave us um that we both felt it and uh he was out that's he was just out. I, I truly believe that God came in his presence as we were praying and just put him to sleep. And uh, he woke up this morning and he was happy. He dreamt uh, good dreams and I couldn't ask for anything more than that. Jesus, you are our Prince of Peace. And Lord God, in the midst of this season that has become so busy, we ask that you would just cover us with your peace, Lord God. That you would indwell us with your peace. That we would walk in your peace in the midst of everything else that screams at us that it needs to be done. That we would be focused on you. And yes, the incarnation of the Prince of Peace is worth celebrating. It is worth observing. But not at the price of our peace. And so, Lord God, we ask that you would just come. Father God, we thank you that we have the opportunity to give back to you just a portion of what you have given to us. Lord God, you ask for enough so that we can prove to ourselves that we're trusting you. And then you take what remains and you bless it so that we have exceedingly abundantly, not just money, but Lord God, you give us all other things. You bless our hearts, you bless our lives. And we thank you, Jesus. Who else but you could take what we have and multiply it so that we have so much? Who else could take our hearts and cause us to be thankful for what we have? And so we rejoice. Lord God, we, we come to you with our offerings. 
We come to you with our gifts of love. We ask that you would receive these offerings from our hands, Lord God. Take them, multiply them, let it become everything you want it to be so that this church can do what it's doing and not also to reach out and bless those around us, Lord God. We ask that you would bless the hands and the hearts that give. We ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. the Lord again. We're going to ask the Lord to come in power here. I certainly need help up here. I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Jesus, come. 
dismissed, Josh. Good job. That was Mark Perez. Everybody point to Mark. Now, they do a good job up there. Appreciate them. So we're dismissing the young people. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of them, but we want to dismiss them, and we want to pray. I hope all of you had a great Thanksgiving. I, I did. We just had a good family time and thankful for what God has blessed us with. Let's pray and ask God to, to come and speak through me. I, I, want to, I want the presence of the Lord. I, I don't want to get in the way. So, Father, thank you for worship, and thank you for this time. I see it, Lord, as a, a troubling time in our nation, a troubling time with families, and I see families, Father, being rocked, a nation is being rocked, the world is being rocked. You're not asleep, you're not absent, you, you have not looked away, you know what you're doing, you're in charge. We lean upon you and trust you, we know no matter what shakes, no matter what begins to crumble and break, you're our rock, and we stand on you. So, Lord, I ask you, with all the notes and all the thoughts and all the prayer, praying and time in this, I ask you to speak through me and give us a word. Teach us and, and, and draw us into your presence. Pray for all those at home, and ask God that your presence, the Holy Spirit, would be in the in the living rooms and the kitchens and the bedrooms and would fill that place that you would be glorified. And we ask you to bind Satan by the blood of Jesus and release us. Release us to worship you, to give to you, to serve you and honor you. Remind us our days are numbered. Remind us the sun does go down it rises again in your land, in your kingdom. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're in the book of Judges. And we, as we look in the book of Judges, we see that uh, it is a time up to the sixth chapter, and even beyond that, that those people were struggling much like our nation. It's called Judges because it's not called Kings. They had Judges. They did not have Kings. Everybody at that time did what was right in their own eyes, just like America today. They had no leadership. They didn't know where they, was go they were going. God wanted to lead them, but they didn't want God to lead them. Joshua had passed away, and the people that were supposed to conquer other nations, the nations around them that were wicked and worshipped false gods, uh, evil gods, 
uh, they didn't conquer them. They compromised. They were lazy. And they were gamblers. When we allow the enemy ground in our lives, we're gambling. We're gambling. They were gambling. They would uh, gamble their freedom away until they were sold into slavery, until God said, okay, another nation's coming and going to uh, uh, take you over. And then they would cry out, and this God who's so loving and so caring, he would come and merciful, mercifully come in and release them. And they would worship God for a while, and then they'd go to gambling again. And then they'd be taken into slavery. And so we find that in Judges chapter 6, that's exactly what's taking place. They're at a time where they have no leaders. There are no judges even rising up to deliver them. All the surrounding nations are coming in, and when they would plant food, just when they're about to harvest the food, those nations would come in and just sit there and eat all the food and take it all away and then destroy the land and then leave. And the Israelites, they would hide in caves and in uh, holes in the ground, and they would, uh, uh, in fear, just try to stay away from these nations, and they were continually... Uh, being molested by these nations. It's a sad story. I saw a woman one time uh, in a store. She had won $2,000 in a lottery ticket. As soon as she did, she turned around and said, anybody want to go to the casino? And she was serious. And so we find that we live in a world of gambling. And I'm not preaching on gambling. I'm preaching on gambling. <laughs> gambling with Jesus. Gambling in our walk with God. Our nation is a nation full of gamblers. We gamble with everything, and we refuse to trust Christ. We refuse to follow God. And therefore, we have nations coming in, even spiritual nations coming in, and putting us into slavery and into bondage. And there's going to come a turn, eventually, where we begin to cry out back to God, I'm praying, and that there would be a revival and a repentance and a turning again. But we are just like the Israelites. We gamble in our walk with God. The title of this message today is The Odds Are In Your Favor. The odds are in your favor. And I do have a passage. It's a little bit longer, but I'm going to read it to you. It's going to give you that background that I was talking about. It's in uh, Ju uh, Judges chapter 6 and uh, following. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them that, that he is God. He gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, other eastern peoples invaded the country. And they camped on the land, ruined the crops all the way to Gaza. And they did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. Verse 5 and of Judges 6. And they came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them with or, or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian. And he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave uh, you their land. I said to you, I'm the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you live. But you haven't listened to me. Verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah. That belonged to Joash the Abizorite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all these wonders in that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and has given us into the hand of Midian. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in your strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian, that Midian's hand, am I not sending you? And then he says, pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. 
And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you'll strike down all the Midianites and leaving none of them alive. The odds are in your favor. The odds of God are in your favor. C.S. Lewis said, it's not your business to succeed, to do right when you have done so. The rest lies with God. You see, God is in your corner. And God sees what's going on in the nation. God knows what's going on in your own life, in your own heart. What you see out of your eyes, God sees that as well. And God knows. God knows your vision is limited. God knows your faith is at times very weak. And God is in your favor. He's in your corner. But some of you are asking, how can the odds be against me if I've got God? And that's really where the rubber hits the road. We don't always understand that God isn't always on our side because our side is not always on God's side. And so we again ask ourselves, what does odds mean? What is, what is that definition of that word? It's the probability of how likely a thing will happen or won't happen. And probability is in your hands. You see, you have the ability to walk with God or to refuse him, to be blessed or to be cursed, to drive out the enemy out of your homes, out of your marriages, out of your finances, out of your body, or you can allow him to come in and ravage the land, the land that God has given you. And I want to talk to you today about four ways in the very beginning of how the odds are against you to succeeding in life and then I want to talk to you about four ways, or a couple ways, that the odds are for you to succeeding in life. And the, one, the odds are against you of succeeding in life when you get involved in what, is, what God says is evil. Look at Judges chapter 6, verse 1. And they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. You see, the odds are against you of succeeding in your walk, in your life, and we need to be told that. You'd think we wouldn't, but we do. When we go against what God says is evil and we say, no, it's good, we're heading to failure. Leonardo da Vinci said, he who does not punish evil commands it to be done. You didn't know he said that, did you? He who does not punish evil commands it to be done. Kierkegaard, a philosopher, said you cannot choose not to choose because you've already made your choice. You see? And so we find that we fail to succeed as believers and followers of Christ when we begin an argument with God and we say what he says is evil, we say it's good. And we begin to walk in that and play in that. And then as you look at verse 1, it says, For seven years he gave them into the hand of the Midianites. You never heard of a God like that, did you? A God who doesn't play around, a God who doesn't fool around. God will give us over, and God has given this nation over. But we find that there are many things that God sees, and we think he overlooks. As a matter of fact, 2 Chronicles 69 says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen. I think the, the rest of the verse goes, And those whose hearts are with them are those who are with him. But God sees. In Revelation 19, 12, the, uh, John describes Jesus' eyes as a blazing fire. God sees. I think I forget that in my own walk with God. I think God overlooks things. I think God doesn't see certain things. I had a dog that was part corgi and part beagle. And when he would get out of the fence, and you'd catch him. His name was Joe. And, and Joe would get out of the fence. I've told this story one other time. And he would start to come out. He would glance at you, and then he'd look away. And, and, and Joe, you'd say, Joe, go back. Go, go back in the yard. Go, Joe. But he wouldn't look at you. He looks away. And he's, he's thinking, because I don't see you, you don't see me. And I'm yelling at Joe, Joe, I know you see me. Get back in the yard. You don't belong there, Joe. And I'd watch that dog, Joe. I'd be yelling at Joe. I don't know how he got. You ever see a dog with kind of a, a skip where they're like sideways? I don't know what that means. That means something in dog language. It's kind of like, you know, fly the coop or something. But he'd be skipping down the road sideways, probably laughing at me under his breath. But we think that God, because we think that God doesn't see things, and he does. And then we find that a lot of times what's evil in God's eyes 
are not, are not really evil in our, our eyes, is not evil in our eyes. You see, we rationalize things and, and God doesn't. We're wishy-washy and God isn't. And we see, he sees black and white and we see gray. And I began to think about that. Why do I see gray when God is black and white? He's very clear. He's very clear. He doesn't, he doesn't whisper. He doesn't like, you know, talk in language I don't understand. He's really clear with me. And he's clear with us. And, and so I ask myself, why do I see things in gray? Why do I want them in gray? For one thing, God told me, he said, you, you always choose comfort. The gray areas are comfortable for you. You don't, you don't like to disrupt anything. The gray areas are conforming. You don't like to go against the tide. You don't want to upset anybody. The gray areas are non-convicting. Can't we just kind of let it go a little bit? And the gray areas uh, are compromising. You see, I don't like anyone upset. Let's just let it go. And God sees things in black and white because it's dangerous in the gray areas. And America moved from the black and white and then rebelled against the black and white of what the scripture said, how clear it is, and then began to move in gray areas. And as they begin, began to fudge, as we began to fudge, we finally find ourselves not in the gray area anymore, but being ravaged by the enemies of God. Compromise is a very dangerous thing. And you can find yourself going for a long time, walking with God, and then you begin to fudge. There's a story that many of you know about. It's Homer's Iliad. And it's one of the oldest documents ever written in Western literature. And it was written during the 8th century. And it is very, very famous. It recorded the Trojan War and the 10-year siege of the city of Troy. And a side note to that, it was an American that found that lost city. It was lost after the war. And after I tell you the story of it, you'll remember in 1871, an American uh, named uh, Heinrich uh, Schlielman, and I'm sorry, that might be mispronounced, um, but he found it. He was digging and digging and digging in Turkey, and he discovered Troy. Troy had towers, and Troy had walls 16 feet thick. And so then we find Homer's Iliad began to describe that city and that battle uh, uh, that the mighty Greek army went against Troy for 10 years, kept banging and banging and banging. And year after year, they were unsuccessful. And they couldn't seem to take the city. As a matter of fact, they lost one of their famous warriors. I think it was Achilles. And they wanted to give up. They were unsuccessful for 10 years. And they were just about ready to give up. And then King uh, Odysseus, I probably mispronounced him, he had a plan uh, for the city and how to take it. After 10 years, he decided to make a horse, and you know this story. He made a wooden, large wooden horse, hollow inside, and he filled that horse full of Greek soldiers. And then they pushed that wooden horse filled with Greek soldiers, mighty warriors, and they left it there. And then they made sure the city of Troy saw them sailing away. And the city of Troy probably broke out in celebration because they thought they had defeated that mighty Greek army. And so as they saw the uh, Greeks sail away in defeat, they actually looked upon this wooden horse this Trojan horse as a gift of victory. And so they opened their doors and they let that wooden horse come in. And they closed their doors and celebrated. And all the men, all the Greeks, they remained hidden in that horse, very quiet. And then late into the night, probably in the early morning hours, they slipped out. And at the same time, that mighty Greek army turned around and came back without the city of Troy understanding that they had come back. And those Greek soldiers slipped out of that hollow horse. And they began to start fires all throughout the city. And they opened the doors 
to the rest of the Greek army. And that's how you get the story of the Trojan horse. But it was based on compromise. And the enemy is relentless in his desire to overcome you, to take you out. And it may be years and years and years, but he's going to try a number of angles and combinations in order to lead you to a life of failure. But with God, you'll always be successful. The second thing we find about uh, the success uh, uh, that uh, you, the odds being against you and uh, being successful, is that this happens when we take for granted how much God has blessed us. When you take for granted how much God has blessed you, look with me very quickly, verses 8 and 9. And he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. Four times God says, I blessed you, I blessed you, I blessed you, I blessed you. And the, the odds are against you ever really being successful in your walk with God when you compromise and you begin to forget the blessings that God has given you. And he has given you his son. Your blessings are not in what you have received. Your blessings are in the fact that God has given you your son. If you were to look at all those eyes, I did this, I did this, I did this. It was, those aren't the blessings. The blessings were, the release was so they could be attached to the father. They could have a relationship with him. And your blessings are not your blessings. Your blessing will always be Jesus. Amen? Amen? Always be Jesus. And the blessings that you receive materially or, or in whatever fashion they come, it's always to open the door to Jesus. And then we find forth, we find the odds are against you in being successful. When you refuse to listen to the one who loves you more than anything, you see, you have moved really off the charts. When you have stopped listening to someone who's speaking into your life and they're only speaking into your life because they love you. Something has changed in you. Something has happened to you. Your heart has become hardened. I see this in marriages. I see this with children. I see this uh, with friendships. Something happens where we begin to take uh, our eyes off of Christ and off of listening to, to how he speaks to our brothers and sisters, and we refuse to listen to anything about God again. Especially when the Bible says in John 13, 1, that he loved him to the end. I, it amazes me the blessings that God has given me and how much he loves us. But you're going to fail when you refuse to listen to the one who loves you more than anyone. You see, what happens then is we become prideful. We become right all the time. We become very narrow-minded. It's only got to be this way. We become controlling. We open the door to fear because the protection of God has begun to vanish in our lives. The Israelites did this over and over and over again. They continued to refuse to listen to God. And so we find in verse 10, very quickly, I want to make sure we get to that. It, we find it says, you do not worship the gods of the Amorites. I'm having a hard time seeing my own verses because I've written all over them. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. There's verse 10. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Something happens in our lives when we refuse to listen to God. You see, something has blocked, something has changed, something has hardened, and we find ourselves far, far away from God. Listening is very important. A lot of times when I'm speaking, your minds wander. I know because mine has as well when I'm listening to other speakers. Have you ever thought about that? You know, research indicates this, that there are three primary elements that cause us to really listen. We sit up and listen to these three primary elements. First of all, it has to be something of value. Something of value. We will listen to that. Secondly, it has to be something unusual. 
when there's an unusual thing that is said, we perk up and we listen. Thirdly, it is something that is threatening. Something that is threatening will cause us to sit up and pay attention. And we just have that research shows that we are open to those three elements. But I think about the gospel. I want you to think about it for a minute with those elements. First of all, salvation through Jesus is the most valuable gift you could ever receive in life. The most valuable gift you'll ever receive in life. Secondly, for me, is my wife. I always say the first thing that, that really changed my life is coming to know Christ. He's the most valuable uh, one that I've ever met. Secondly, is my wife. And so we find that the gift of Jesus is the most valuable gift you could ever receive. Don't ever forget that. Keep listening to Jesus. And secondly, we find that the fact that the holy God would have anything to do with sinful mankind, even loving them, is extremely unusual. We are unholy. We are very uh, uh, prickly. We are very uh, 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 fickle. One minute we love God, the next minute we're heading towards the world. One minute we're praising, and the next minute we're struggling in sin. It's highly unusual for this all-holy God who has never sinned to turn to such a fickle, unbelieving, fighting creature like mankind. That's highly unusual. It is the most unusual thing that you will ever hear. And thirdly, very quickly, is the fact that the consequences of reaching Christ, rejecting Christ's sacrifice on the cross are very threatening. The consequences of rejecting Jesus are threatening. Now, do you remember where I talked about the gray areas? And I'm going to give you the answer to that. The gray areas. Do you remember I said they're comfortable? Do you remember non-convicting? Do you remember I said how I many times will, will choose those areas that uh, are, are, are uh, against God? And so we find this third one is threatening. Because when you don't know Christ... You are threatened with an eternity without him. You are threatened to hell forever and ever and ever. Compromise comes in because men will not talk about hell any longer. Men will not share that without Christ you cannot go to an all-holy God, the Father. That Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. So enough of those areas where you're missing a successful walk with God. Let me talk to you very quickly about the odds of success are on your side when you follow these guidelines. First of all, we see it in the life of Gideon, when you agree with God's choices, his selections. Look with me in, in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. And the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Bezerite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And so we look at verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. You see, life is a lot easier <coughs> when you agree with God, what God selects in your life. You're not made to fight God. You're not, you're not strong enough to fight God. And whether Gideon liked it or not, God was singling him out. God was calling him in his generation when everybody would run to holes in the ground and run into caves and everybody would drop their food and run away and refuse to stand up and fight. God was calling Gideon. You see, God's choice, his selection for these years of COVID, for these years of violence, and, and uh, uh, anarchy that are hitting the country. And these years of persecution for Christians and Jews that are coming. God's selection is for you and for me to stand up and share Christ. And Gideon didn't like that. Gideon wasn't comfortable with that. And you may not be either. But God has called us. He's called you to carry the cross. He's called you not to be ashamed of the name of Jesus. 
He's called you to pray in public. To share with people about a living God. A living God who loves you and died on the cross. And can I give you some advice? I've given you this before. And this comes from God and it's advice for me. First of all, all don't argue with him like Moses did. Don't argue with God. Exodus 4.10 Oh, Lord God, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. Do you think God didn't know that? God was calling Moses to speak. And Moses was arguing with God. Don't argue with God on any level. You'll never win. God is not on your level. God's on his own level. There is no other level higher than God. Don't argue with him. When he asks you to do something, he knows the cost. He knows that he'll be with you, and you can do it. And then secondly, the second bit of advice is don't run from him like Jonah, who took a ship to Tarshish, did. The Bible says in Jonah 1.3, Jonah arose and fled to Tarshish. And he thought he could outrun God. You cannot outrun God. God is everywhere. And God simply smiles when you run away. Now, this holiday season, don't run from God. Don't run in any direction towards any addiction. Don't run from God. And then thirdly, third set of advice is don't laugh at him like Sarah did. God had made a promise, and the Bible says in Genesis 18, 12, so Sarah laughed to herself. You see, God isn't joking when he has his hand on your life. God isn't joking now as you're seeing one COVID after another COVID after another COVID. God is not joking when you've got a lot of rebellious people, evil, wicked people in your government that thinks they can stick their finger in God's eyes. God's not joking any longer. The Midianites will come in different forms and, and the judgment will come and be upon this nation as it has. What should you do? Would you understand God or not agree with him? Just agree. You're just a child. You don't know what God knows. Agree with him. Agree with him like Esther did. If you want a successful walk with God, agree with God like Esther did. In Esther 4, 14, Esther didn't know what was going on, but the Israelites were about to be destroyed, all of them. And Esther's uncle came to her, and he said this, she's a queen, she's all set. But, it, but her uncle came to him and said this, that you were created <clears throat> for such a time as, don't forget that. You're created for this time. You're not created to hide in caves and to run away. You were created for such a time a time as this. If not, he'll take you out. He'll take you out of here. Her answer was that of self-abandonment. You want to know how to be successful in this life? Abandon yourself. What you're living in is a world that will not abandon itself. It will abandon God first and preserve itself, exalt itself, glorify itself, but it'll abandon God. She abandoned herself. And she said this in Esther 4, 15 and 16. She said, if I perish, I perish. I have a poem that's pretty neat. I need to read to you. And it's very small print in my notes. So listen to this with your heart. It's by Carol Wimmer. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not shouting I've been saved. I'm whispering I get lost. That's why I chose this way. When I say I'm a Christian, I don't speak with human pride. I'm confessing that I stumble, needing God to be my guide. When I say I'm a Christian, <clears throat> I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I'm weak, and I pray for strength to carry on. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting that I failed and cannot ever pay the debt. When I say I am a Christian, I don't think I know it all. I submit 
I submit my confusion, asking humbly to be taught. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are all too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say that I'm a Christian, I still feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartache, which is why I seek God's name. When I say I am a Christian, I do not wish to judge. I have no authority. I only know I'm loved. Do you know that God loves you? Do you know that God is on your side? God desires to bless you. God desires to take care of you. In Judges 6, he said to Gideon, I did this and this and this and this. God will say to us at the end of all this COVID and when this nation begins to disintegrate, when we stand before God, say, Randy, Randy, I did this and this and this. I held up my part. I was so loving to you. I love you so much. But you ran away. You refused. You hid. In your own little place, you abandoned me. Can I close with this? God's on your side when you allow God to be your only strength. I said only strength, not one of your strengths, your only strength. The problem with Christianity today and us preachers, God's only one of our strengths. And so the word is not preached in power. And people aren't saved. And we're not seeing the movement and miracles of God anymore. And the Holy Spirit doesn't overcome the church because he's only part of our lives. And we fail God because we abandon most of him only to recognize part of him. Now the Bible says for us in Psalm 84, 7, they go from strength to strength. Do you understand that the DNA in you, the spiritual DNA in you, is from one strength, and maybe a trial, but to the next strength in Christ? You're not destined for defeat. You're not destined to hide. You're not destined to run away. You're destined for success in the strength of Jesus Christ. I can do all things through the strength of the one who lives within me. And that's Christ. Christ in you. You see, God wants you to be strong during these last days. God wants you to understand that he's with you, holding your hand every step of the way. Max Lucado said this. He said, God never said the journey would be easy, but he did say the arrival would be worthwhile. You see, God wants to free us of pride. God wants to strip us of flesh. God wants to release us of our own strength and release us into his arms. Now, you're going to come up against some mighty waves are coming, but they're not anything compared to Christ. And so as we attach ourselves to Christ, we begin to understand that it's really us and Christ. It's us and God. That he has called us in this generation. As a matter of fact, we see it in closing as we see his hand upon Gideon. Look with me in verse 14. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and, and save Israel out of Midian's hand. And then notice verse 14, the second half. Am I not sending you? And then we see that God says this, I am with you and you are with me. Look at verse 16. I will be with you. I'm sending you and I'll be with you. If I could have your attention for one last poem, it seems that God gave me some this week. And it's in the book of Chuck Swindoll's uh, Strengthening Your Grip. And these really spoke to me, and this is how God spoke to me this week. And so I'll close on this. I had walked in life's path 
and easy tread. I had followed where comfort and pleasure led. And then by chance in a quiet place, I met my master face to face. With station and rank and wealth for goal, goal, much thought for body, none for soul. I had entered to win this life, life's mad race. And when I met my master face to face, I built my castles and reared them high till their towers had pierced the blue of sky. I had sworn to rule with an iron mace when I met my master face to face. I met him and knew him and blushed to see that his eyes full of sorrow were fixed on me. And I faltered and fell at his feet that day while my castle vanished and melted away. Melted and vanished and in their place I saw naught else but my master's face. And I cried aloud, Oh, make me meet to follow the marks of thy wounded feet. My thought is now for the souls of men. I have lost my life to find it again. Ever since alone in that holy place, my master and I stood face to face. You're standing in the presence of God. In the midst of COVID, in the midst of the disintegration of the United States, political upheaval and treachery, socialism, fascism, Marxism, you're standing still in the presence of God. And you, you keep your eyes on the master's face. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are so encouraging we thank you that you and you alone are the only one that is holding us up. We thank you that although the wind and the waves are beating at our feet, our eyes are fully fixed upon you. Lord, we thank you that you give us confidence to go on and that because you have called us, we know the path has been cleared. We know the glory is yours. We know the victory has already been won. But Lord, there are some that are struggling. Some of us are wavering. Some of us are weak. We ask you to reach down into our hearts. We ask you to train our minds and our thoughts to be fixed on you. My prayer even now is for someone who doesn't know you. They know of religion, they know of a church, they know of getting a Bible, maybe for memorizing some scripture, but they don't know you, and they're afraid, and they're wavering and struggling. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that if there's anyone that struggles and, and is questioning, do I really know Jesus? Are my sins really forgiven? When I die, will I go? with God. If there's anyone listening even now, I ask, Father, that you would soften their hearts. They would not compromise for the gray areas. They would want it very clear and very distinct that they have invited you to be their Savior, to be forgiven, fully forgiven, and to know this day, this moment, they're forgiven. I ask, Holy Spirit, you rest on them right now through BoxCast, or through years later of watching this message, that they would bow their heads and receive you as their Savior. So, Lord, rest on them now as I lead them in prayer. Would you pray with me if you don't know Christ as your Savior? There's a question. There's a doubt in your mind. There's been gray area between you and God, but you want it very distinct now. You want to know this date, this day, this hour, this moment, you receive Christ as your Savior. I believe in my heart, in my mind's eye, I can see people praying this prayer and really meaning it. Would you pray this in your heart? Oh, Jesus. You don't have to pray exactly like I pray, but you pray with your heart. That's what all of heaven hears. That's what starts the recording of your name in what Revelation 21, I believe, talks about the book of life. Your name is being written as you call out to God. Oh God, I know that I am a sinner. 
I know that I have committed sin and I cannot pay for sin. I can ignore it. I can compromise with it. I can, I can act as though it didn't happen. I can justify it, but I could never be clean of it. Only you, God, can cleanse me of my sin. And so I come before you with a need. It's a big need, God. I need to be forgiven of my sins. Would you forgive me, Jesus? When you died on the cross, you took everyone's sin upon you. Your sinless blood washed everyone's sin who receives you away. I want that washing. I want to be forgiven. I want to know that when I die, I will go to be with you in heaven forever and ever. Would you be my Savior, Jesus? I can't save myself. Come into my heart and save me, Jesus. Forgive me of all my sins, the big ones, the small ones, the ones I don't even know of. And when I die, when I close my eyes, when I breathe my last breath, when I say my last word, word, and I close my eyes, please, Jesus, may I open my eyes and see you, master of my life. May I see your face. Lord, save me. And then thank him. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I trust you. I trust you as my Savior. No matter what happens, no matter my failures, you'll always be my Savior. You'll always forgive me. and Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer at home through BoxCast, and you meant it in your heart, that's all that matters. It wasn't word for word. It's your heart. God sees your heart. God knows your heart. And you'll make mistakes. This side of heaven, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. You just keep running to Jesus because he'll always have his arms open wide for you and for me. And start again. Don't stay in the sin. Don't stay in the darkness. Don't give up. Don't beat yourself. Go back to Jesus. Put the sin back on the cross and start fresh and new and clean with the Lord. If it's an addiction, then you're in a battle. Fight. Put your fists up, your spiritual fists, and keep saying no. Keep fighting. Keep swinging. Stay in the fight. Don't give up, because Christ will never give up on you. And even if you fight till your last breath and you keep falling down, when you close your eyes, even if you go down as you're leaving this life, you expect, I promise you, you'll have Christ's hand reaching to pick you up to enter into heaven with, you, with him. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Would you stand now? We're going to have a short time of ministry. And... Uh, <clears throat>